today we're talking about how God helps the discouraged. Elijah was a man just like you and me. He talks about that in James chapter 5. And uh, that's our theme for Watford for the month of May. Elijah, a man just like us. And we're preaching through his life from 1 Kings 17 to 2 Kings chapter 2. And here we are today in 1 Kings 19 and looking at how God helps the discouraged. Now, for the benefit of our South Bucks friends, I think we should first of all remind ourselves what happened in 1 Kings 17, which we talked about last week, which is, and I'm going to ask the Watford Church in a moment, if you could uh, share anything you remember from what we talked about last time when we're in 1 Kings 17. So be ready for that in a moment. Either you can unmute yourselves or put something in the uh, in the jolly old chat box. But why, why are we looking at Elijah? There's a connection here with the teaching materials we're putting out both in Thames Valley and in Watford on uh, issues connected with mental health, emotional well-being and spirituality. That's, that's a teaching focus for Thames Valley and Watford. And it seems to me that Elijah is one of those characters in the Bible that can also help us to understand the way that God helps those who go through particularly tough, disturbing times. And we see that particularly in, in this passage here. So that's why we're looking at Elijah. Now, Watford, what do we remember from last week, from 1 Kings 17? What was happening? What was going on? What did we learn about God, about Elijah's life? Dawn says the ravens and how we can be ravens for each other. That's right. The ravens came and fed Elijah when he was hungry and in need in the famine. So God sent the ravens to feed him and sent him to a place where there was a brook with water even though the land was very dry at that time and there was no rain. All right, thanks, Dawn. What else? Anything else we remember from 1 Kings 17? Akin, where is my Kerith Ravine, my place of shelter? Okay, right. That's where God sent him to be fed by the ravens. And I shared last week how I feel that the Watford Church, and actually really also the Thames Valley Church in many ways, is my Kerith Ravine, a safe place given me by God to be fed and watered. I love that idea. Thanks, Akin, or Pat, whichever one of you that was. Anything else from 1 Kings 17? I learned also that God cared for or cares for everyone, not just the Israelites, in the sense that he helped Elijah go and um, help the boy. With exactly. The, when, yeah. That's right. He was sent to a widow who lived yeah. in, a, in a pagan land yeah. outside of Israel, in the land... Uh, dominated by the Baal worship. He was sent to help her and the boy who died. Great stuff. Yeah, Leon and Sarah, God provides for our needs and cares for us. We saw that. That's right. Okay, Nasagi, Elijah's confidence in his identity, his name. Very good. I'm glad you remember that. His Eli Yah, meaning that he belongs to God and God is his God. That's his, that's his very name. So very confident in his identity there. Excellent. All right, let's move on. So, we learned that he, he had a strong identity. We learned about the kindness of God, that even though Elijah was praying for a famine, effectively, for drought, God provided for Elijah with the ravens and the brook. We learned about the power of God, because God saved Elijah by providing food and saved the widow by providing the food miraculously. When he, the widow was asked to create bread, she didn't have much left, and, she, and Elijah said, trust me. So she makes bread for Elijah, and then there's enough. It doesn't run out. And then her son dies and God provides salvation life through the power of God by Elijah, uh, praying for the son. And then the son is revived. The first uh, example of death coming back to life in the whole of scripture. We also learned a lot about prayer last time because the way that Elijah prays over the boy, it's passionate, it's persistent and it's honest. We'll have to come back to that another time. And at the end of 1 Kings 17, the key to the whole uh, chapter is simply this. In 1 Kings 17 verse 24, the woman, the widow, who's seen her son revived, the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of God, the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. So this is a pagan widow in a, a land where Baal worship is the norm. Yahweh is not known. And yet in that land, this person comes to know that Elijah is a man of God, that he is a true prophet, and the word of the Lord from his mouth is the truth. And that's critical to this whole period of Israelite history when there's this battle between the Baals and Asherah worship, 
and the worship of Yahweh, which has been compromised by the actions of Ahab and Jezebel, King Ahab and his, and his pagan wife uh, in Israel. Now in chapter 18, which we won't look at today, but it's more often preached on than 1 Kings 19, and we'll just do a very brief summary of chapter 18 so we have the context. So what we see at the end of chapter 17, the beginning of chapter 18, is that God says after three years of famine, he says, okay, the time has come. And he sends word to Elijah and he says, go and present yourself to Ahab. So go back to Ahab. He told him three years ago, it's not going to rain till I say so. He says, go back and I will send rain on the land. And so Elijah goes to present himself to Ahab. Severe famine is still going on. So three years of prayer, the time has come. God has made his point that he is the God of all things. Baal is supposed to be the God of fertility along with Asherah, his consort, and the God of rain. And so God is saying, yeah, no, you think Baal's in control of the rain? Mm -mm. I'm in control of the rain and I've now proved my point. So Elijah goes back and on his way, he meets Obadiah. And who is Obadiah? Obadiah is like a... Um, a, a, a big a big time civil servant in the court of Ahab who does a lot of organizing and administration. And Obadiah, a devout believer of the Lord, had hidden a hundred prophets from uh, Ahab uh, and Jezebel. And he meets up with Elijah and uh, Elijah says, we, we got to go to uh, Ahab and confront him. And Obadiah says, but, but th then they'll, but th there's a lot of problems with that because if I go and tell Ahab you want to meet him and then you're not there when he comes and you're not you know because you know who knows where you are you're always flying around all over the place Ahab will kill me and so there's a lot of fear here but Obadiah is also letting Elijah know that he's not alone maybe Elijah it seems doesn't know about these hundred, hundred hidden prophets so Elijah is less alone than he thinks the desperate nature of the famine is illustrated by the fact that Obadiah is going through the land looking for any grass that anybody can eat. That's what Ahab has sent him on a quest for. Fear predominates and Obadiah assumes that Ahab will kill him. Then from verse 16 on, we see the confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And this is a proxy fight between, between gods. It's not Yahweh and Baal fighting each other. It's the prophets of Baal and the prophet of Yahweh, in a sense, in a fight. Uh, Ahab is met by, by uh, Elijah in verse 18. And Ahab's response to meeting Elijah isn't terribly positive. It's not like, oh, gl I'm glad the real prophet of Yahweh is here. Instead, he says, is that you, you troubler of Israel? So not a good thing. And troubler is, we get the word hex from this. It actually means it's hex. So it's like, I've met the hex on Israel. That's who you are. You are the hex on Israel. This is God's prophet. Yahweh is being described as the hex on Israel, when indeed, really, it's Jezebel and Ahab and the prophets of Baal. There are lots of Baals. He accuses him of ba following the Baals, which means that it's not just one, tem one temple or one altar. It's spread throughout the land. The land has been infested with, uh, with uh, false worship. And we find out that there are 450 prophets of Baal against Elijah. So I don't, don't know whether you like, uh, you know, to be the underdog or not. One tends to prefer to support the underdog. I'm sorry for all you Chelsea supporters today, but I'm sure you can imagine that pretty much anybody who wasn't a Chelsea supporter yesterday for the FA Cup would have been supporting Leicester as the underdogs. But you tend to support the underdog, but I don't know about you. I think if I was asked whether I would like to be Elijah... Or I'd like to be one of the 450 on this occasion I'd prefer to be one of the 450 it's not good odds one against 450 so <clears throat> there's a big fight and uh, it cut the long story short most of us probably know the story um, Elijah lets the Baal worshippers go first and tells them to uh, bring down fire and they they cut themselves they dance around they yell they they go to all extent to do that and Elijah taunts them somewhat saying uh, perhaps your God is uh, deep in thought perhaps he's a bit deaf maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened they shout louder and louder until their blood and they cut themselves until blood flows they're desperate and nothing happens and Elijah says okay my turn and he pours lots of water onto the uh, altar which would douse it of course even further from uh, making it more unlikely that it would uh, burn with fire and they do that lots of times. And then Elijah steps forward and prays. 
In verse 36, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel. I am your servant. I've done these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back to back again. Then fire from the Lord fell, burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water from the trench. When the people saw this, their reaction, they fell prostrate prostrate and cried the lord yahweh he is god the lord yahweh he is god and elijah commanded them seize the prophets of baal don't let them get away let's kill them all and uh, elijah says to ahab go and eat and drink see food is going to become plentiful now the sound of heavy rain is coming ahab goes off to eat and drink elijah climbs to the top of mount carmel bends down to the ground, puts his face between his knees and prays. And he prays all to God all together. I think seven times he prays and then a cloud comes and it's clear that rain is coming. And so Elijah says to Ahab, hitch up your chariot, go down before the rain stops you. So in other words, go home before the rain is, is so heavy you won't be able to get home. The sky, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose, heavy rain starts falling. Ahab rides off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah tucking his cloak into his belt he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel that's the context here for what we're talking about so I, I guess Elijah must be excited at this point he must be feeling strong Ahab is repenting right he's actually doing what Elijah tells him to do the people of God are repenting they're bowing down and worshiping Yahweh God is authenticating Ahab as the prophet against all the prophets of Baal now he believes I can confront Jezebel. I've got Ahab sorted. I've got the people of God sorted. I've got, I mean, I've got it all sorted. Jezebel's next. Jezebel's going to be a pushover after this lot. So he and Obadiah now, they could release the other prophets that have so far been hidden. They could get the worship of Yahweh reestablished. The altars to Baal can be dismantled. Altars to Yahweh rebuilt. The tide has turned after three years of prayer and struggle. There's nothing in this account to forewarn us that he's about to suddenly burn out in such a dramatic way let me show a screen and show you a little video so this is mount carmel uh, penny and i were lucky to be there in 2018 i've taken the sound off this video because it was a very blustery day and you can't hear the wind uh, because the wind means you can't hear anything but this is the top of Mount Carmel. So the people were arranged probably down below. And when the fire came down from heaven, can you imagine how many people could have seen it? Look at that plain there, flat area. All the people would have seen it. The fire coming down from heaven, very dramatic, very powerful, evident that God is God, that Yahweh is Yahweh. There's the rest of our party. We were on a, uh, an Israel tour with Douglas Jacoby organizing it. It was a fantastic time. There we go with the top of Mount Carmel. So... So this is astonishing. Can you imagine this experience? It would have been amazing. And then we get to chapter 19 that Jamie uh, read so well. Then we get the crash. We get an, an astonishing crash. He goes to see Jezebel and she says, I don't care about what happened on Carmel. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill everybody around here. And Elijah's response is not to stand up to her is to run for his life go and hide you know we have these experiences sometimes don't we we have spiritual highs and then we have spiritual lows we have times in our life when we feel like nothing could ever destroy our faith weaken us deflect us from God we feel that sometimes and at other times we feel completely lost empty drained directionless oppressed out of control there's a crash Elijah has experienced an exocet missile of fear fired by Jezebel now from the intensity of the Mount Carmel encounter bear this in mind Elijah has initially journeyed from Carmel to Jezreel where he encounters uh, Jezebel somewhere between 17 and 30 miles depending on the route you take and he did that in the supernatural strength that God provided. But then he runs away, he flees in a state of panic from Jezreel, all the way down to the south. That's where he's gone, to Beersheba in Judah. And that's about 100 miles. I don't know about you, that was going to take it out of you. Uh, we don't know how he traveled, but however he traveled in those days, a journey of 100 miles was epic. 
he must be exhausted. And then from the settlement in Beersheba, he goes a further day's journey into the wilderness and immediately falls asleep. In the light of this, it seems obvious that a key factor in his burnout was physical exhaustion. He was what you might call dangerously tired. Being tired is pretty normal, but there's a tiredness which is beyond the normal. And it's, it's like it's a dangerous kind of tiredness. It's funny, isn't it? Well, not funny, but sad, perhaps. He's not afraid of hundreds of prophets, some of them carrying weapons. But he's afraid of one foreign woman. Jezebel scared him, scared the wits out of him. It's clear from this example and many others in, in the Bible that whether we're walking in faith or walking in fear concerns who we're listening to. Are we listening to the voice in our head that causes doubt? Are we listening to the voice of God that gives us faith? So what does Elijah do? The one thing he does right here in chapter 19 is he prays. He prays. Now, it's not it's quite a contrast to his prayers in chapter 18 of calling down fire or chapter 17 where he, he asks God for, for life for the boy who had died. It's a little bit different. He prays, well, he prays to die. It's a bit of a contrast. I wonder if he thought God would answer his prayer. He's used to his prayers being answered. No rain, life for the boy, miraculous provision of food, fire from heaven, and now he prays, to die. I've had enough, Lord. Have you felt that? I've had enough. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. He lays down under a bush and falls asleep. What a tragic place to be and what a tragic contrast to what has been. On the other hand, we could say that we could celebrate his honesty with God, at least. He feels in some sense perhaps secure enough to tell God exactly how he feels and what he wants, even though surely it cannot be what God himself would want. He still has a relationship with God, perhaps even some kind of hope, even if well hidden. I think it's instructive that he doesn't threaten God that he will take his own life. He demonstrates a respect for God by simply asking for God to end his life. Now, uh, we can't give... Elijah a clinical diagnosis of a mental health issue as if you know saying he was clinically depressed or something we can't say that because the Bible doesn't use those terms and doesn't give us enough detail and uh, I wouldn't presume to give him a, a, anybody a diagnosis like that we've got trained counselors and therapists on this uh, on this service today and uh, we, we've got to be a little careful about that but but what we can say about Elijah is that someone in this situation as described with these kinds of feelings is clearly in an extremely vulnerable and desperate state. He is not thinking clearly, he is not thinking objectively, nor is he healthily aware of how others feel about him, especially God. He instead he gives God a comprehensive resignation speech. Are you, I'm, an, I'm gonna be an ex-prophet from now on, okay, God? So that's where he is, he's at. Now, let's look at the kindness of God, and this is what I hope I want to focus on today is not so much Elijah, although Elijah, in as much as we can relate to him, is helpful. But the focus today I'd like to have is on God's response. What do we learn about God through all of his interactions with Elijah? And I'd suggest a few things, and I'd like us to break it out and have some discussion. Firstly, God's kindness is, is shown by him sending an angel. He sends an angel to touch him. He says, get up and eat. This time in the wilderness, he doesn't send birds. He doesn't send ravens. Or oh, by the way, from last week, you may remember Penny's uh, picture of the raven, right? This is, uh, you, Scott, South Bucks won't have seen this, but Penny drew this last for me last week when we were talking about First Kings 17. This is a life-size drawing of a raven. You see how big it is? I mean, next to me. These are the things that fed Elijah back in First Kings 17. Pretty awesome, big. Uh, big birds right there. So that's the raven. But this time, he doesn't send ravens. He sends an angel. Isn't that awesome? He sends an, a, an angel because an angel is a personal messenger from God himself. God starts with physical replenishment, gets, gives him a meal. 
God, as uh, someone called Ruth Barton said in a commentary I read, God did not waste time trying to deal with Elijah intellectually or even spiritually because it wouldn't have done any good. He began by dealing with Elijah's physical weariness and depletion. He let Elijah sleep. Then he woke Elijah up when it was time to eat and drink, provided food and water for him, told him to go back to sleep, and then started the process all over again. See, Elijah had completely lost any sense of get up and go. And, he got, and he'd also dismissed his only companion. He had a servant. He, he got rid of him. So he was completely isolated. But thankfully, God had not forgotten him. He lovingly sent an angel to tell him to get up twice in this passage. And, uh, and he, he, the angel touched him. It was physical touch. I think it was so important. These words from, uh, and the provision from God's own messenger was a way of God showing Elijah that he was not forgotten, he was not finished, he was dearly loved, he was beloved by God. And after allowing him to sleep, the very next thing that God did for his depleted servant was to give him a good meal. The tenderness, I think the tenderness in this situation is really striking. And then he journeys for 40 days and 40 nights, and that must have been some meal to keep him going for 40 days and 40 nights, some super feast, I bet. So we notice a few things here. God's response to Elijah's unreasonable request to die is not to scold him. Instead, it's to improve his physical circumstances, to give him time to rest, to physically touch him, to give him simple and gentle direction. And he gives him an acknowledgement. He says, it's too much for you. God says, I know. It's too much for you. So this we see ultimately that personal connection reassurance helpful questioning and reaffirmation of his value and effectiveness are something that god wants to convince elijah of and then they have a conversation so after all this replenishment this gentleness god takes him to the mountain for a conversation an unusual conversation in unusual uh, context uh, in the entrance of the cave and we have the earthquake we have the wind we've got all these monstrous things done by god and then we have the still small voice on the mountain where God had appeared centuries before to give Moses the Ten Commandments. Notice that God takes the initiative, asking Elijah twice the same question. Why are you here, Elijah? See, when an all-knowing God asks a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. It's because he's seeking to engage us in an honest conversation. He's a relational God and knows that you and I, like Elijah, can lose perspective. He loves you and my, uh, you and I. He has a plan for our well-being, even when we're in the pit. Jeff Lucas, in order, put it like this. He imagines God posing this question to Elijah with an invitation, a bit something, something a bit like, Elijah, talk to me. Throw aside your nice, pleasant speech and just tell me what's going on in that locked mind of yours. And then notice that Elijah is clearly not afraid his to speak his mind to God. He says the same thing twice. Look, I'm a prophet. I've been working hard and I'm, I'm whacked. You know, I'm really tired. Elijah repeats himself. A sign uh, uh, that his mind is locked in an unhealthy position. And Elijah's statements are a mixture of truth and half-truths and, and falsehoods, to be honest, in what he says to God. But it reveals that he's safe enough. He feels safe enough and close enough to God that he can be totally honest with him. We can be. Even when we're in the pits, we can be honest with God. You know, Elijah's not trying to dress up his situation or present things in an overly religious and spiritual way. He's just telling God how he feels about things, even if he's misguided. And even if there is an absence of the, absence of the positive turnaround to praise that we see in many of the Psalms of Lament, for example. So if, if Elijah could feel secure enough with God to be this honest... How much more today, when we can be, when we have the fuller revelation of God through the love and the kindness and the grace of Jesus Christ. See, Christian prayer is not a, a ritual. It's not a religious duty. It's part of a dynamic relationship with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so he's told to go back. Go back the way you came, verse 15. Go to the desert of Damascus. I've got things for you to do. Ephesians 2.10, God has got good works for us to do he's prepared for us all of us on this call whether we feel like it or not whether we feel ready for it or not God has good things for us to do 
Elijah could be forgiven for thinking that God has no more work for him to do as a prophet because he's let God down by his reaction to, Je to Jezebel. He could be filled with, with shame. He'd be feeling ashamed. He could be filled with guilt or a sense of unworthiness as, as a leader, knowing that he, he, he demonstrated a lack of courage at a crucial moment. He, you could say he fell away when simply one person confronted him. He's let God down. He's let the other prophets down. He's let Obadiah down. He's even let Ahab down. He could be saying to himself, I can't trust myself anymore. My calling and my gifts are compromised because of my failures. I wonder if you've ever felt like that. I have several times. In fact, it happens more often than I'd like. And you see, discouragement distorts reality. He says twice to God, I'm the only one left. And he already knows Obadiah's got a hundred other prophets. It turns out there's a lot more than that. But di discouragement distorts reality. We need God to help us to get, get clarity on what reality is with him. He tells him about Hazael. He tells him about Jehu. He tells him about Elisha. Hey, there's a team ready to work with you. And he gives him a calling. And we see the call there as he goes to find Elijah. He anoints uh, Jehu. He uh, gets Elijah on. Uh, Elijah goes to Elisha. And uh, he gets a, a peer to go with him, a younger peer. He had a servant before, but now he has a fellow uh, prophet prophetical peer, if such a thing uh, exactly exists. And he has another 10 years of work, it appears, to, working together with Elisha to establish more worship of Yahweh in God's land amongst God's people. So this is God. Now, I'm going to break us into breakout rooms for a few minutes for us to discuss this simple question, which is this. What have you learned about God from what we looked at here today that could help you when you have a crash or when you have the opportunity to help someone else in their crash? OK, I'm going to wrap up. We're going to take communion. But has anybody got anything they'd like to share? Anything that stood out to them? Anybody want to uh, offer a thought, an opinion? A conviction, uh, a confession. I don't know. Uh, um, what I found encouraging was that when Elijah was at his lowest point uh, and he fell to sleep, God acted immediately because he sent an angel at once. Mm. He didn't say, "Okay, let me just give Elijah some time to get to his senses." Uh, he acted immediately. Yeah, all at once, the angel touched him like straight away. Yeah. In other words, God was very attentive to his prayer. He's right there with him. It's great. Thank you, Joe. Anything else? I think the thing that really stood out for me was um, as a teacher at school, we practice nurture principles and we understand that there are children that arrive at school and need to have their physical needs met before they're in a place to be able to learn. And, uh, and it was just, you know, seeing that heart of compassion and and god's nurturing of of elijah where he was at so that uh he could come back to a place where um god could use him again um i think we had we we, we spoke a, a lot about how god knows us so intimately and knows what we need and chooses the best sort of medium to to address our needs and I think it's it's a very very crucial thing because just I was speaking to one of my children I don't want to say which one it's not, not to embarrass them but they had this idea of you know they were feeling sad at that moment and they were worried that if they're feeling so sad and God sees that they're sad he might think that they're better off in heaven and obviously we know what that means and they didn't want that to happen and so we had a, a chat about how god sees anyway but god understands and god when you're feeling sad he would want to almost help you through it and, and want to comfort you and i i think it was it was really encouraging because a couple of things that she was but the child was sad about in the following days something happened and I was able to say, I think this is God actually comforting you because you were sad about this, this stuff has happened. So God does see 
and God does understand and meet us where we are. Yes. And um, yeah, and, and I guess we shouldn't be afraid of having those negative emotions and trying to just hide them or shush them away because at the end of the day, God does see them and it's better to bring it to him because he's the best person to, to, to comfort us. And I think that's what's happened in, in Elijah's case. He didn't go and want to take his own life by himself. He brought it to God and he said it openly and God was able to help him. Super. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. He did bring everything he was and what he was going through to God, even though it was in a sense ungodly what he was praying. Still, he brought it. And uh, that's an inspiration for us in our relationship with God to bring out the real self to him. Might also be an inspiration to us to bring the real self to each other as well and be safe with each other in that way, like God and, it, and Elijah seem to, to be. Thanks, Garth and Lissy uh, in the chat. We're grateful that God is with us in all the situations. We are not alone. In, that's right. It doesn't matter what's going on. Um, Elijah, Elijah didn't feel it in 1 Kings 19 at the, when he was in his, at his lowest point. But God had another 10 years of productive work for him to do. God still has good stuff for you and me to do no matter how we're feeling. I believe that. And perhaps we see in this chapter 19 a model that uh, shows us principles of how to treat one another and how to relate to God not to say that the exact things God does here for Elijah are the exact same things we should do for each other when we're in a tough place but the principles behind what goes on here I think are very applicable to our own interactions with each other uh, when when so, a friend of ours perhaps in church or outside uh, has a crash the first thing we need to offer is kindness and God does that by providing a meal and a space for sleep and that kind of thing, a protection and safety. But what that is for in a situation, in a specific situation, will be different. But, but the, the key thing is, first of all, he shows kindness, not judgment, not condemnation. And not you should, you ought to. But first of all, kindness. The second thing he does is he has a conversation with him and last actually last week i think no in the in the video about um mental health issues from joe uh, uh john jim pickett i think we talked there about how to have a conversation about how to listen and listen and ask open questions and there's some time here for for uh elijah to be listened to by god and even though elijah is a bit messed up in his thinking god does not correct every wrong he just listens I think that's a beautiful thing. So there's kindness followed by conversation, followed by then a call. There's a call from God to Elijah. And I have to be a little careful about how we do that with each other. But nonetheless, I think there's a sense of perhaps conveying confidence that I'm with you or God is with you. Uh, together, God has, still has things for us to do. So there's after the crash, there's kindness, conversation and a call. I think it's really important for us to remember, perhaps wrapping all this up, how God wants us to feel secure in his love, secure in his kindness to us, secure in his patience with us, uh, secure in his, his desire for us to be close to him, and that he loves us and treats us with a godly love, a fatherly, godly fatherly love, no matter what we're going through no matter how we feel even when our prayers are ungodly god still wants to hear from us that's part of it god loves and and what we take bread and wine largely to remind us of this that bread and wine symbolizes the body and blood of jesus shed for us broken for us because god god's love is really intense God's love is unreasonable, really. It's it's just from grace. I don't deserve it any more than anybody else, neither do you. But for some reason, God showers his love on us because that's just who he is. What an inspiration to the today and to the week ahead for us to remember that God, <clears throat> God just loves us passionately, unconditionally, and in a sense, unreasonably. I want to finish with this uh, scripture before we take bread and wine from Titus chapter 3. At one time, we too, you and me, 
were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love, I've highlighted it there in the scripture, kindness and love, which Elijah experienced here at his lowest point, when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, you and me. Not because of righteous things we had done, hmm, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously <clears throat> through Jesus Christ, our Saviour, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to, to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Elijah had excellent and profitable things still to do. You and I have excellent and profitable things still to do for God. And God is with us and, and our motivation for what we do for him comes from the knowledge that he offers his, us his kindness and his love through Jesus Christ. As we take bread and wine, we celebrate God's kindness and love. So before we take bread and wine, I can ask Penny to unmute and pray for us.